Hello, my name is Philip Hanson, and today I would like to talk about the death penalty. I'm going to argue that you only need to know one big thing about capital punishment. This is from a book I'm writing on capital punishment. I'm almost done. The one big thing is that having the death penalty most likely results in a net increase in the deaths of innocent human beings. In this video, I will argue that a rational consideration of the evidence makes this conclusion inevitable. But I want to state at the outset, I think it's important to show respect for people on both sides of the debate. Most of them are decent people who sincerely believe in their views. But I think there's often something missing from the debate. I would argue that there's a tendency for both sides, actually, to ignore evidence and reason in favor of passions and emotions. This is especially pertinent to the issue of capital punishment because it is in that sweet spot, not a purely values issue like gay marriage and not an issue that's too complex to understand, the evidence on the death penalty is actually very understandable. So I'm suggesting that we use head and heart, as Miguel de Unamuno and Pascal and many others have recommended. Pascal captured it beautifully and simply when he said, so let us work on thinking well. That is the principle of morality. But Pascal thought we needed the heart as well as the head, and he said, two excesses, excluding reason, allowing only reason. There's another issue that we need to clear up at the outset, and that is that we are dealing with a choice, the death penalty versus life in prison without the possibility of parole. We need to keep this constantly in mind when debating the merits of capital punishment. So this is not a for or against questions. This is, this is a which is better question. If you're not willing to look at the issue with this in mind, I can't see how you can be a credible voice on either side of the issue. So let's begin by looking at the potential benefits of capital punishment. First, it can reduce suffering of victims' family and friends, uh, some sort of closure for them. Secondly, retribution, the person gets what they deserve. And third, protect society, the person who is executed obviously can't kill again. But these arguments must always be framed with a focus on that marginal difference between capital punishment versus the alternative of life in prison without the possibility of parole. So viewed in this light, these three potential benefits of capital punishment lose some of their force. To the extent that some people find life in prison worse than capital punishment, points one and two might actually be better with life in prison than with execution. And point three essentially becomes moot in any case because we can lock people up so they can't get out again. Capital punishment is a difficult topic, so here's a photo of Mount Rainier and fog in the trees as a mental palate cleanser for you. So now I would like to talk about what I call the three inescapable facts about capital punishment. These are the three facts that lead to us to the one big thing I mentioned at the beginning. And these three inescapables are, first, the death penalty does not deter murder. Secondly, innocent people are sent to death row on a regular basis. And third, the criminal justice system cannot be made foolproof. <clears throat> there isn't time to discuss all of the important issues about capital punishment that I cover in my book. For example, the fact that capital punishment costs considerably more than life in prison. The fact that there are disparities based on race, especially the, the race of the victim. The fact that rich people don't get the death penalty. Try counting up the number of rich people on death row. The fact that it's arbitrary. Look at the Green River Killer in Washington State. He murdered 48 women, but was spared because he promised to tell them where some of the bodies were buried. All of these issues, and many other issues, are important. We're only going to look at the three issues that support the one big thing. So let's take them one at a time. The death penalty does not deter murders. I hate to be blunt, but anyone who has looked at the evidence and still thinks that capital punishment deters future murders is simply not thinking clearly. Even some people opposed to the death penalty don't realize that deterrence is a myth. Pascal would not approve. <laughs> now, common sense might tell us that uh, people would be less likely to commit murder if they knew they might be executed. After all, if we didn't have punishment for embezzling, there would be a lot more people driving around in Ferraris and Rolls Royces. But murder is different. Albert Camus, in his marvelous book, Reflections on the Guillotine, uh, Guillotine, quoted a magistrate who said the vast majority of murderers did not know they were going to murder while shaving in the morning. Interesting point. So what about the actual evidence on deterrence? What does that say? Well, murder rates do not go up when countries abolish the death penalty. Portugal, Portugal began the process first in 1852. It took a while for full abolition for them, but today more than 100 countries have abolished capital punishment, including virtually all developed countries except us, of course. So members of our peer group 
include countries like Chad, China, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, Libya, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. What a great group to be part of. So here's another palate cleansing of just a tiny fraction of the countries that have abolished capital punishment along with the year of abolition. Portugal, Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, Peru, France, Netherlands, Slovenia, Hungary, Greece, Italy, and Turkey. So looking back more than a century around the world, abolishing capital punishment did not result in increased murder rates. In fact, they often went down. Another point is that murder rates are higher in U.S. states that have the death penalty. Here are murder rates in states without the death penalty in blue and with the death penalty in green. The murder rates are 50% higher in states with the death penalty. So this brings up an interesting question. Does this mean that having the death penalty increases the murder rate? Criminologists call this brutalization. Well, Arthur Kessler had an observation on this. Uh, he said, legal barbarity begets common barbarity. As an aside, Kessler's book, Reflections on Hanging, is in my opinion the best book ever written on capital punishment. It was published in the 1950s together with Camus' book, Reflections on the Guillotine, also an outstanding book, by the way. But back to the question of brutalization, could it be that executions demonstrate to the public that it's okay to kill people if they have grievously offended us? Perhaps. The trend suggests brutalization, but one has to be very careful with correlations without proof of causation. For example, here we see that the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. So we must be very careful with correlations. Tyler Vigan has done a number of excellent correlations like this. Also, virtually all expert criminologists agree that the death penalty is not a deterrent to murder, and they are the experts in this field. The percentage of qualified criminologists who think capital punishment deters murders is about the same as the percentage of qualified climatologists who deny climate change. In other words, about 2 or 3 percent. Now, in the 20th century, the British government formed two commissions to study the death penalty. They took a year to complete, well, I'm sorry, they took years to complete, and resulted in two reports, one of about 800 pages and another of about 1,400 pages. They looked at every conceivable piece of data from around the world, and both commissions concluded that deterrence was a myth. Kessler summarized this. He said, This belief in the irreplaceable deterrent value of the death penalty has proven to be a superstition by the long and patient inquiries of these two committees, yet it pops up again and again. Like all superstitions, it has the nature of a jack-in-the-box. However, often you hit it over the head with facts and statistics. It will solemnly pop up again because the hidden spring inside it is the unconscious and irrational power of traditional beliefs. So capital punishment as a deterrent follows what I call Gide's Law. André Gide was a Nobel Prize winning French writer who said, quote, everything that needs to be said has already been said, but no one was listening, so it all must be said again, close quote. I love that. I call this Gide's Law, and it applies to many things. It certainly applies to the quote unquote discovery that capital punishment does not deter murders. Now, as if we needed any more evidence, the Committee on Law and Justice of the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences has also weighed in. This panel of experts looked carefully at the available data and concluded that the evidence does not support the contention that capital punishment prevents future murders. But as Arthur Kessler said, the jack-in-the-box will still keep popping up. The famous curmudgeon H.L. Mencken talked about this phenomenon. The most costly of all follies is to believe passionately in the palpably not true. It is the chief occupation of mankind. So just when you think the idea of deterrence has finally been laid to rest, it reappears, kind of like road work in, on these signs. This was not photoshopped, by the way. I screeched to a halt to take this photo. There are only 20 meters between the end of road work sign and the road work ahead sign. <clears throat> Okay, the second inescapable, innocent people are sent to death row on a regular basis. So here's the most devastating statistic in the whole debate about capital punishment. As of today, 156 people sentenced to death since 1973 have been released for reasons of innocence. In other words, they've been exonerated. This is not a debatable point. The data are available and easy to access. If this were a debate based on reason, just this one fact should make capital punishment untenable in a civilized society. This is also the reason why it's so dangerous to try to speed up the process to execute people more quickly. 
Many of these 156 people were exonerated after 10, 15, 20, in some cases 30 years after conviction. Speeding up this process would just increase the number of innocent people executed. And after, this is an important point. After they're executed, we almost never find out if they were innocent because efforts on their behalf basically stop after they're executed. A study done by Samuel Gross and colleagues uh, concluded that at least 4.1% of defendants sent to death row would be exonerated. I don't have the time to go into the details, but I've studied this paper carefully and I believe the results are credible. So all of the disturbing evidence on sending innocent people to death row brings up the question of justice. If you say justice requires that certain murders be executed, and I do understand that sentiment, but if you say that, you are also saying that the incremental increase in justice that comes from execution versus life in prison without parole outweighs the injustice of occasionally executing innocent people. To me, that seems to be an indefensible position. So the third issue is that the criminal justice system cannot be made foolproof. How could so many innocent people be put on death row? Well, it's obvious that our criminal justice system is fallible. We have a criminal justice system that is a complex endeavor, endeavor with many players, most but not all of whom are honest and trying to do a good job. A good analogy would be our healthcare system, where we also have many people working together in a complex system. So if errors in our healthcare system are the third leading cause of death in the United States, why do we think that somehow magically our criminal justice system is able to avoid errors when condemning people to death? Can we fix it? Well, unfortunately, most of these flaws are resistant to remedies because they're part of human nature, prejudice, incompetence, desire for vengeance, fallibility of senses, uh, etc., etc. So it's going to be very difficult to fix. Even with criminal justice reform, there's no way we can avoid sending at least some innocent people to death row. Okay, the conclusion. The three inescapables, death penalty does not deter murders, innocent people sent to death row, we can't fix the system. Those three inexorably lead to the one big thing, having the death penalty most likely results in a net increase in the deaths of innocent human beings. If it doesn't deter murders, and if we send innocent people to death row, there's no other conclusion. Given this, one could argue that the death penalty is absurd. Now, there are many absurdities in our modern world. You've probably seen a few. Uh, there's the fact that the yellow, yellow truck company uh, paints its trucks orange. For comparison, the caution sign in the lower right is yellow. Then there's the fact that SpongeBob SquarePants has rectangular, not square pants. But these absurdities do not kill innocent people. The death penalty almost certainly does. Perhaps Albert Camus hit on the heart of the matter. He said, let us call it by the capital punishment. Let's call it by the name which, for lack of any other nobility, will at least give the nobility of truth. And let us recognize it for what it essentially is, a revenge, an emotion, and a particularly violent one, not a principle. Now a quote from former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, who, by the way, was appointed by a Republican, Gerald Ford, and Stevens was a person who had supported capital punishment in the past. <clears throat> he said, For me, the question that cannot be avoided is whether the execution of only an insignificant minimum of innocent citizens is tolerable in a civilized society. Given the availability of life imprisonment without the ability of parole as an alternative method, of preventing the defendant from committing further crimes, I find the answer to that question pellucidly clear. When it comes to state-mandated killings of innocent civilians, there can be no insignificant minimum. So here we have a person who saw the evidence and changed his mind based on a rational evaluation of that evidence. In his marvelous essays, Michel de Montaigne was one of the first people I know of to speak out several times forcefully and eloquently against capital punishment. If I'm ever shipwrecked on a desert island, I hope I have my copy of his essays with me. Montaigne said, After all, it's putting a very high price on one's conjectures to have a man roasted alive because of them. Is it time? Many people believe that eventually we will join the rest of the civilized world and abolish the death penalty. So why not now? Thank you.